So, so this time I'm going to talk about um, parsing or generation of trees with dynamic programs. Um, and so um, as I mentioned before, in, in previous classes, we have a couple types of linguistic structure that we're going to be thinking about. Um, so uh, we thought about dependency structure, uh, which focuses on uh, relations between words like this. And phrase structure, which focuses on uh, the like phrase and the structure of the sentence uh, that looks a little bit like this. Um, they both kind of encode different things in different ways, um, and they're both useful in their own uh, in their own rights. So parsing um, is predicting linguistic structure from the input sentence. And last time we talked about transition-based models or incremental models. Um, and this time we're going to talk about dynamic programming-based models that are like um, uh, like the CRF model for part of speech tagging. Um, and what was in the reading, and also if you've taken algorithms for NLP, um, uh, we have uh, dynamic programming for phrase structure parsing. And um, like as I said, phrase structure parsing is models to calculate phrase structure like this. And um, one important insight uh, here, uh, which wasn't completely elucidated in the um, in the uh, reading material because uh, they focused on a very specific version of uh, using the CKY algorithm. Is that parsing is actually similar to tagging in a way? And what what do I mean by this? So tagging, um, what we talked about in the CRF time, uh, the CRF uh, class was basically we're searching in a graph uh, for the best path through the graph. So basically, each time point, we have a node. Um, we have a, uh, each node corresponds to a part of speech tag at that time point. And we have a path where we travel from the previous uh, part of speech tag to the next part of speech tag. So we have kind of this uh, decomposition structure like this. Um, whereas if we think about parsing, um, parsing can be viewed as search in something called a hypergraph. Uh, for the best tree for a um, for a sentence. Um, and the reason why I like to introduce things this way is because, like finding the best path through a graph is a very general thing in um, in you know computer science, right? We learn about Dick, uh, Dijkstra's algorithm and other things like this in our basic computer science courses. Um, and hypergraphs are also kind of a general thing that you can also think of applying to other things other than just parsing. So. Uh, the reason why I like to think about it in this formalism is even if you're not interested in generating phrase structure trees, you can still uh, you know, use this general concept. And this was also used in things like uh, translation um, uh, as well. So um, what is a hypergraph? So basically, um, in order to define a hypergraph, the first thing we do is we define a degree uh, where the degree is of an edge is the number of children that that edge has. So if we think of degree um, one, uh, like something, actually, this looks like it's degree zero because my animation disappeared here. <laughs> uh, this actually should have, um, uh, should have I here. So uh, just imagine there's an I on this slide. Um, so degree one is kind of the normal thing we think of as an edge, a quote unquote edge. Um, and that's going from one node to another node. So we have an arrow pointing from a node to another node. Um, when we have something like degree two, uh, basically what this is, is this means um, that we have one node and it's pointing to two nodes as its children um, with a single edge, single hyper edge. And then degree three, we have one node that's pointing to three nodes uh, as its children. So um, is that a question? OK. Um, so we, we have three, uh, so we have three nodes here. Um, so this is a de degree three hyper edge. Um, so the degree of a hypergraph is the maximum degree of its edges. And a graph is a hypergraph of degree one. So um, we, can, uh, we can think of a normal graph, and this is just an extension of a, a normal graph. So we have some example, maybe we have an example from part of speech tagging or, uh, or um, 
like named entity recognition or something like this. And this is a graph of uh, degree one. So what does a graph of degree two or three look like, or a hypergraph of degree two or three look like? So basically, I took an example here um, from the famous uh, you know, sentence, I saw a girl with a telescope. And I saw a girl with a telescope is ambiguous, right? It has two, uh, two examples. Um, So, um, I, I have another uh, funny example that some of you might have seen if you were uh, um, at a talk earlier this week, um, which is uh, this one. Um, let's see if I can find this. I can't, I can't find it, so okay. So we, we have, um, the example is I like, I like watching a model train. And so if you have, uh, if you have an old uh, grandfather looking at um, a model train going around uh, <laughs> the Christmas tree, then this is, uh, you know, a model train is a noun phrase. Um, and if you're a deep learning researcher looking at your computer, then it's a, uh, <laughs> a model training is your, your verb phrase. So, but anyway, like there's all kinds of this syntactic ambiguity here. Um, and uh, like basically, uh, th this particular sentence has multiple types of ambiguity. So I saw a girl with a telescope. You could either have seen a girl with a telescope, in which case this is a noun phrase. So in other words, this noun phrase, a girl with a telescope is a single unit. Or you could have seen a girl, and you, you saw that girl with a telescope. So you basically saw, um, uh, you used the telescope, and both of these are part of this verb phrase. So basically, the, the, blue, um, uh, the blue edge here is the one that's connecting the uh, big noun phrase. So this is the girl who is holding a telescope with the verb. And the red edge here is connecting um, uh, saw with a girl and with a telescope. So these two edges, which one you choose coming out of this node, um, can resolve this uh, syntactic ambiguity. Um, so uh, are there any questions here? No? OK. So a quiz. Um, uh, before I get to that, so like, Graphs um, we could use for part of speech tagging. And the way we use graphs for part of speech tagging, like in a CRF, is we calculated a weight for each edge, basically. We calculated a weight for each edge, which was corresponding to the probability or to the feature value of outputting the word itself uh, together with the part of speech tag, or the feature value with um, uh, the transition between the previous part of speech tag and the current part of speech tag. Um, and generally, the weight is a negative log probability of, uh, of the output. So for example, if we're just talking about a, a regular context-free grammar, like the ones that were covered in the reading material, it would look something like this. We would have a negative log probability uh, for verb phrase going to uh, VBD and P, PP, and also a negative log probability going from verb phrase to VBD plus NP. Right? So what we want to do is um, like searching for um, the best part of speech sequence uh, through a graph, like we did for the CRF using the Viterbi algorithm, we can search for the best parse in a big hypergraph like this. So um, some of this might seem disconnected with like the CKY algorithm or something like this. Um, but uh, the CKY algorithm basically is a method for creating a hypergraph uh, and calculating its weights kind of in one pass. So basically, what does the hypergraph of the CKY algorithm look like? Um, and it looks like this. So um, we, uh, at each time point, um, basically, we will have edges corresponding to all of the possible grammar rules. So if we look at a, um, a CKY chart, um, 
不止。If we look at a CKY chart, like the one we had in the reading material, what, what do we have here? We basically have nodes, where each one of these is a node, and we have edges, or hyper edges, uh, where the hyper edges degree to. So we have one edge that's pointing to this and this, we have one edge that's pointing to this and this. Uh, we have one edge that's pointing to this and this, et cetera, right? So now what we want to do is we want to do search over this, uh, over this hypergraph. And in order to do this, um, the, way we can, the way we can do this is we can do something that looks a lot like the Viterbi algorithm for graphs. Uh, the only difference is instead of taking the best score for a single child, like we did in the, um, in the Viterbi algorithm, we're taking the best score for multiple childs, adding them together with the score of the production itself. Um, so you can see here, this is the more traditional uh, thing that we look at in the CKY algorithm. So in the CKY algorithm, we, um, uh, we have only rules of degree two. Um, so we basically have uh, the thing on the left, we have the thing on the right, uh, we have the log probability of the production, and that becomes the score. Um, we could also, um, this is beyond the standard scope of the CKY algorithm, but we could also have things of, uh, with three children. And so in that case, we add together all three of the children. So we add all the children from the hypergraph here, um, from the hyper edge here. And then um, because we want to do search, we basically find the minimum. Uh, so we find the best edge, uh, which would be the one with the minimum score, assuming higher score is, uh, is worse. Um, and then we can calculate the best score. So this looks a whole lot like the Viterbi algorithm that I talked about two, uh, two classes ago, right? You know, the only difference is that we might have multiple best scores down here instead of one. Yes? Could you give an example of how you calculate the score for a given production rule? So how do we calculate the score for a given production rule? The really simple way to do it is to add and divide. So um, I'm, I'm going to talk about alternative methods to do it in just a second. But the very, very simple method is um, we have a supervised training corpus where we have a verb phrase. Um, and it goes to uh, VBD uh, NP um, you know, 10% of the time. So um, and then it goes to other things, you know, the remaining 90% of the time. So basically, the score for this would be you know, negative log uh, 0.1, right? So um, any, other, any other questions regarding this? So um, this is uh, an, an analogous to Viterbi algorithm, which is over, uh, over graphs, but we're doing it instead over hypergraphs. And this is actually called the CKY plus algorithm. Um, so CKY plus or CKY plus plus or something like that. I, I forget. Uh, I forgot which one uh, it is, but I think it's CKY plus. And basically, what this is doing is it's reframing the idea of CKY. So we're not just looking at you know kind of the the static single chart that we have here, but rather uh, able to do this over any hypergraph. So why why is this why is it interesting to look at it this way? Um, suddenly, this frees you from the shackles of thinking about, like, you know, we're ch we're parsing a single um, uh, we're parsing a single graph um, uh, or a single type of thing just to get a, a parse tree from it. And some examples of other things that people have done with this is um, let me see if I can find an example. So I'm not sure. I'm sorry, I didn't prepare an example. But like another example of things that you uh, people did in this uh, way were uh, translation models. And the way the translation model uh, would work is basically you would um, you would have a uh, 
bottom-up translation algorithm where you would translate a subphrase um, like this. Um, so you have the dog. Um, uh, eight, uh, eight grass. I don't know why eight, why grass, but uh, so then you, you have a bunch of different translations for the dog. Uh, you have a bunch of different translations for grass, and then you have x a y, and then you can kind of translate this x a y and fit the um, and fit the uh, translations into the appropriate places um, here with some sort of uh, like graph-based uh, search algorithm. So you would expand all these possible uh, all these possible translations and treat them as a hypergraph and do search over them. Yeah. Yeah, so you would use a large training set and you basically automatically extract these rules that could then form a hypergraph or something like this. So now um, now with uh, like neural MT models, we're not doing um, we're not doing things in this way, but as I mentioned before, in order to really generalize well to new examples and stuff like this, uh, even in neural models, kind of syntactic formalisms that consider the tree structure or hierarchical na nature of language work well. So maybe you know a model that looked a little bit more like this, that had some sort of hierarchical structure in it, in a form uh, of a hypergraph, would generalize better to you know new languages, new domains, uh, etc. So. I like translation, which is why my example is from translation, but it could also be something related to um, text generation uh, or text classification even if you wanted to if you wanted to do it that way. So um, yeah. Okay, so this is how to search for the best path through a hypergraph. Um, the way of uh, the other thing that we want to do in addition to searching for a best path, is um, is calculating the partition function. And the reason why we want to calculate the partition function is um, for the same reason we wanted to do it for CRFs. Basically, we want to be able to maximize the likelihood of a true path uh, with respect to all the other paths through. So it's actually pretty uh, easy. Um, sorry, that's a typo part. So what we want to do is we want to find the marginal probability of each span given a CFG grammar. And then the partition function is the probability of the top span. So this is the same as the, the CKY algorithm where we, um, where we simply took the max, uh, the best score here. Um, and uh, we just do the log sum x instead of the max. So this is the same thing we did for the CRFs as well, right? OK, so now we have our preparation. Um, so what we know is we know that we can express um, a big set of potential parse trees as a, um, as a hypergraph. Uh, we can do one best search over it. We can do uh, calculate the partition function over it. So now how do we use that in a neural model? Um, and there's a bunch of different ways. Um, the first uh, kind of work on this uh, was neural CRF parsing. And um, this is the an alternative answer to the question I got earlier, which is uh, how do you calculate the probability of production rules? I said um, add and divide. But um, just like a lot of the other things that I've talked about in the past few classes, instead of adding and dividing, we can also take a feed forward neural network. Um, so the way this works is we have some sort of feature extraction where we extract features from uh, various things. Maybe we extract features from the span itself. Um, we extract features from, uh, you know, like the grammar rule, what type of grammar rule we're using. Um, we extract features from uh, the left span, the right span, the internal spans, uh, the words on the boundary, uh, whatever. Um, and uh, then on top of this, uh, we then run our inside-outside algorithm to calculate uh, the uh, marginal probability. And then we take the... Um, the score for the true tree, and we compare it to the score for all of the um, all of the other trees. So this is similar to the Biol CMCRF, um, or sorry, this is similar to. Actually, it's more maybe more similar to um, 
uh, just like a, a local um, part of speech tagging model uh, with feed forward neural networks and then a CRF on top of it, then BioLSTM CRF. Um, but you could just use a BioLSTM for this also. Um, so, but anyway, either way, the basic idea is you extract some sort of features representing the span, and then you take the features representing the, the various spans, you combine them together to calculate the, um, the probability of a production rule for that span. So on top of that, there was an even simpler method. And the fact that this worked so well is, was kind of surprising. And the basic idea was um, we have an even simpler idea, which is we have a strong model. We have a BioLSTM or we have a, a transformer. And basically, we take all of the spans that appear in the sentence, and we simply try to decide whether they are a constituent in the tree or not. So we, we look at um, she enjoys playing tennis, period and we try to predict its span label. Um, we have she, and we try to predict its, uh, you know, that this is a noun phrase. Um, we have playing tennis, and we try to predict that this is a, uh, is a verb phrase. And for all the other spans that aren't a constituent, we just try to predict not a constituent. So you just throw all of these in there, and you try to predict each span, uh, whether it's a constituent or not. Um, so, this allows for various loss functions. So one way, one way that you can do this is you can, um, you can just predict each of these independently. So you enumerate a whole bunch of spans. You enumerate positive spans. You enumerate negative spans. And you just try to predict yes or no, or you try to predict the span label or no, no span whatsoever. Um, and the... Um, or you could have a structured loss function where you calculate uh, the values for each span and then you calculate a partition function um, and you try to uh, maximize the probability here. Um, there's also um, inference algorithms. So they can use the CKY algorithm in this. So basically you, um, you calculate in, using a dynamic program uh, to, uh, to calculate the maximum probability tree. Or you could just go top down and what they did in top down basically was they found the the highest scoring span. So the top span is always like a sentence because that's kind of how the uh, pen tree bank is made. A sentence or noun phrase or something like this. Um, and then when you get to the next level, you try to split this into two. So you try to split this into a left side and, and a right side, and you just find the maximal scoring split point in phrase uh, boundaries. Um, and then once you split the this uh, phrase up here, you then move to splitting this phrase, then you move to splitting this phrase, then you move to splitting this phrase, and then you're done, basically. Yeah. So a uh, general question, like all this tree structure, the algorithm, does it have to be semantic meaningful in the training data, or? Do the structures, do the structures have to be semantically meaningful? Like, like uh, say in this algorithm, mm -hmm. does the training data have to be semantically uh, meaningful, or? Does the training data have to be semantically meaningful? Um, well, you need to you need to be able to label the training data. Um, so, like the training data, um, you need to be able to get the correct tree on the training data. And if the data isn't semantically meaningful, you might not be able to annotate syntax. But if it's a syntactically correct but semantically meaningless sentence, then uh, sure, I think you could use that for parsing. So, like. Um, the, the stereotypical example of this is uh, Chomsky's example of colorless uh, green ideas sleep furiously, which is a syntactically correct, but like semantically essentially meaningless sentence. So if you wanted to train on that data, you, you could. Does, does that answer the question? Or? Right, I'm just curious, like, for all this parsing problem, it seems like the word itself does not matter that, that much. Oh, so that's a good question. So for parsing, um, it seems like the words themselves don't matter that much, and it's only the actual underlying structure of the sentence that matters. Um, if only our lives were so easy. It's, <laughs> but let me say it that way. So like, one of the reasons why parsing is hard is because semantics actually plays a very strong role. Um, and specifically, there's something called selectional preference. Um, and select, what selectional preference is is basically what nouns tend to be the subjects and objects of verbs, or uh, you know, tend to occur in certain prepositions or things like this. And things like, um, I saw the girl, I saw a girl with a telescope. 
Um, that may be the most likely, um, maybe the most likely analysis is I saw a girl um, using a telescope, like I was using a telescope to see the girl. But if you said, I saw, I saw a girl with a skateboard, then 100% the girl has a skateboard, right? right. So um, semantics and, uh, and things definitely play a big role in this. Yeah, just to backtrack a little bit, yeah. but how does that word meaning reflect in that Adam device role that you wrote on the blackboard? Oh, so it doesn't actually. So it doesn't reflect in the end divide rule, and that's actually why these don't work very well. Why these why these methods are not sufficient, and why we need a neural level So, um, yeah, very good questions. Any other questions? Okay. So now, um, moving on to the state of the art. Oh, by the way, um, University of California Berkeley are the people who like do all phrase structure parsing all the time. So all of these papers are from them. But uh, they have a, uh, um, so they have their most recent method in, in doing this is um, basically a self-attentional encoding method um, plus a structured inference algorithm on top of it. Um, and so the way this works is you have um, your input, uh, you then have an encoder where the encoder is a self-attentional encoder, you know, standard transformer like we, uh, we tend to use nowadays. Um, and then they have a CRF style decoder on top of it. And they have some tricks about how they uh, take the self-attentional encodings and convert them into uh, things that are conducive to calculating uh, calculating the probabilities here, but if you want to, a parser to calculate English phrase structure parses, I definitely uh, recommend this because it, it works quite well. Um, but like the basic underlying idea is not that different from the CKY algorithm uh, or hypergraph search algorithm that I talked about here. Okay. Um, so any, uh, any questions about this? Okay. So I'll move on to the next one. So the next one is a dependency parsing uh, with dynamic programs. And um, what I'm saying dependency parsing here, but actually similar, um, similar algorithms could be applied to just about any sort of thing calculating relations between um, you know, entities or, um, or, tech, or words or text through sentences. So um, I, this is more general than just dependency parsing, but I'll talk about it from the scope of dependency parsing because that's the most obvious example that we have. So um, graph-based dependency parsing is kind of another name for dependency parsing uh, that uses dynamic programs. And the basic way it works is you have the uh, sentence as a fully connected directed graph. Uh, so basically you have a graph um, expressing all of the possible connections between all of the words in the sentence. And then you score each edge. Um, and I say score each edge independently. So um, what I mean by first order here is basically each edge is scored independently, regardless of whether the other edges exist in the, in the um, uh, parse tree. So each edge is given a score. And then we uh, apply some sort of algorithm to uh, convert this independently scored graph into the actual dependency parts of the sentence. So this is kind of the overall view. Um, for this part, this is um, not uh, this is not too complicated uh, once you know how to use neural networks and stuff like this. Um, so I'll mainly focus on this part, but I, I will talk a little bit about how we featureize our models. So um, before I go into that, um, I think it's worth knowing a little bit about the graph-based and uh, transition-based parsing. Um, so th this is similar to a comparison between like history-based models, uh, for example, for part of speech tagging, and CRF-based models. So if you remember from two classes ago, I made a similar comparison. Um, so transition-based models um, can easily condition on infinite tree context. So you can have like an RNN, that reads in all of the operations that you've done so far and um, encodes them into a vector and uses it to influence all your next um, decisions. However, uh, things like greedy search algorithms cause short-term mistakes or teacher forcing causes mistakes uh, due to you getting kind of out of your element and uh, relying too much on past context despite the fact that it was wrong. 
So in other words, these have all the problems that history-based uh, models have as well. So graph-based models can find the exact best global solution uh, via a dynamic programming algorithm. However, they also have to make local independence assumptions. So same problem with CRFs, right? Um, so it's good to know the difference between these. So now let me talk about uh, a dynamic uh, programming algorithm that can take our uh, spanning, can take our scored edges and turn it into a spanning tree. And the example is the Chu Liu uh, Edmonds algorithm. And basically, um, as I said, like graph search is a very common thing in computer science. You know, we um, uh, we think about it independently. Of, uh, of anything related to natural language processing. So this algorithm also uh, is, uh, is older than its NLP applications. Um, but basically the way this works is you greedily select the best incoming edge to each node um, and, some, uh, and basically subtract its score from all incoming edges. Um, given the selected edges, you, uh, if you, you search for any cycles. And if there are cycles, you can track the cycle into a single node. Um, and then you recursively call the algorithm on the graph with the contracted node. And then finally expand the contracted node and delete an edge appropriately. So this is very abstract. So I, I'd, like to, um, uh, I'd like to give an actual example. So like, let's say we have book that flight um, as an example. Um, so in this case, we have book has the highest score. Um, and then that and flight uh, kind of form a cycle. So like these both have um, high, uh, high scores here. Um, so what we do is we subtract the max for each. So now we have like zero, zero like this. Um, and we have a cycle. So we can track that cycle into that flight. Um, we recursively call the algorithm with the contracted node. So now we have um, this going into here like that. And then we uh, expand. Uh, the node, and now because we know that this uh, incoming edge is going uh, going into flight, now we can delete the node that is inconsistent with that interpretation here. So um, I'm not going to go into a bunch of detail with this because realistically, I think very few people in this class are actually going to have to implement this. Um, but just like the important thing to know is that there do exist these algorithms that can kind of uh, do this uh, minimum tree search for you. There's also other examples. So there's something called Eisner's algorithm. Um, so this is a dynamic programming algorithm to combine together trees uh, in n cubed time. So uh, one good thing about this is essentially that um, this is very similar to the CKY algorithm. So it looks a lot you know, more um, coherent. You can do things like calculate partition functions, uh, et cetera. Um, the bad thing about this is it only allows you to do uh, projective uh, dependency trees. Um, so what a projective dependency tree is, is basically a tree where you don't have anything that looks like the, um, it, there's very few non-projective dependency trees in English, so it's, it's very hard to come up with uh, an example. Um, uh, of this, but the easiest way to do it is to insert an adverb into a into a sentence in a strange place. But um, let's see. Okay, sorry, I'm, I'm not coming up with an example, but. Like, they, to, to give a very abstract example, um, if you have ABCD, um, a non projective tree is an example where you have uh, edges cross uh, like this. So, um, in general, a dependency tree is not going to have edges cross. It's going to look, um, uh, you know, something like, uh, like this is an example um, where if you draw, drew all of these out, they wouldn't be crossing, but um, uh, a non-projective tree is like this. And as I said, there's very few in English, but there are many in other languages, like Czech, for example. Does anyone, has anyone found an example of a non-projective sentence in English? No? Okay, well, it's not super important. So anyway, um, 
So projective dependency parsing is easier because you can parse it in way in things that are like um, uh, like the CKY algorithm. Uh, and Eisner's algorithm is an example of this. There's also something called Terjan's algorithm, uh, which is like two Wu Edmonds, but it has better uh, better runtime. So these are two uh, famous algorithms with respect to this. Um, it's a bit more complicated. So anyway, so now now we have something like this. So how do we train our models? And um, the uh, the way that these are often trained are using something called the structured hinge loss. I'm actually going to talk about this next class, um, but to, just to give a very very um, a very very high level idea, what you do is you um, find the highest scoring tree. Um, maybe you can even just ignore the penalizing the correct hash. So we run the Chulu Edmonds algorithm. We find the highest scoring tree. And if that highest scoring tree is not the same as the correct tree, you upweight the correct tree and you downweight the highest scoring tree. So this is something called the structured perceptron algorithm. We're going to talk about it next class, so I won't go into a huge amount of detail. Um, so uh, just you know, take me for my word in, in that you can train these. So then once we do this, um, how do we calculate features for graph-based parsing? Um, basically, what we want um, is we want features that um, connect the parent and the child. So um, we want to know whether the parent and the child are likely to be uh, you know, um, connected to each other. And um, there are basic unigram features. So these are features about the parent. And what these tell us is how likely is the parent to be a parent? Is a parent like, you know, like it, in some syntactic formalisms, determiners are never parents. So if we just look and see the parent of this edge is a determiner, we can just give it a really low score and, and move on. Um, similarly for the child. Um, then you also have like bigram features or bi lexical features, which would be like this word corresponds to this word. So that would be an example where um, like C with a telescope makes sense, but C, uh, C with a, um, uh, or eat, eat hamburger makes sense, but eat computer does not make sense. Um, so that would, that would be uh, an example of something you can do here. Um, and then they also have like in between features and surrounding word features, but now we just throw a neural network at it and we don't need to worry about those. Um, so um, all of these were conjoined with arc direction and arc distance. So like how long is the connection? So for example, you might have a determiner and a noun are very likely to connect to each other if they're very close, but they're very unlikely to connect to each other if they're uh, very far away. Or they're also very unlikely to connect if the determiner is to the right of, uh, of the noun. So um, these were kind of the features that we wanted to pick up on uh, for this. Um, so, like, this is, um, you know, obviously now we use a neural net instead, so we'll get to that in a second. Um, another thing to be aware of is that I was talking about first-order dependency parsing. So first-order dependency parsing, we basically calculate the probability of each edge in the graph. Um, however, this is not um, necessarily optimal. Um, and to give an example, um, in some syntactic formalisms, um, saw a girl and saw with um, might be, um, would be first order dependencies, but there's no way you could d distinguish between like saw with a telescope and saw with, um, uh, saw with a skateboard, for example. So what second order features give you is they basically say, okay, I'm seeing the girl with, and that width is uh, corresponding to telescope. Um, so once you start adding second order features uh, that correspond to two edges, you can start coming up with things like for uh, where they're two steps away, and that could be useful as well. And then third order goes even farther. So maybe it's uh, very likely to see the moon with a telescope, but it's less likely to see a flower with a telescope or something like that. So a third order feature would give you that. Um, so this can extract more expressive features, but there's definitely higher computational complexity here uh, to the point where um, usually approximate search is necessary if you get to the third or fourth order uh, dependencies. 
However, this is like n to the 6 or something like that, or n to the 4 or 5 if you do pruning. So maybe if you just threw a GPU at it, you'd be OK. So you know, maybe a GPU could just do this for you, and you wouldn't have to worry. OK, so now moving to neural models for graph-based parsing. Um, the first thing we do, of course, is neural feature combinations. This is almost like a recurring theme so much that we did, you know, um, uh, we don't need to worry about it. But basically, it's similar to the Chen and Manning uh, transition-based model, uh, but they took uh, they used a neural net as a feature combinator. Um, they used average embeddings of phrases, used second-order features, etc. And um, basically, they took the average of the the words between. Um, and then they took the prefix, they took the suffix, averaged them together, and then used this in the decision about uh, edges. And um, the, this helped. Uh, this made first order parsing better uh, and faster. Um, and second order neural parsing was better than third order uh, non neural uh, attachment score. Um, so the next thing, of course, what we do in 2016 is uh, we, we throw an LSTM at this. So now the LSTM doesn't uh, require us to do um, uh, feature uh, extraction uh, ourselves. We can just uh, use by LSTMs. Um, but now the state of the art, um, maybe not exactly state of the art, but close enough to state of the art, is this um, uh, thing with a neural feature extractor and by FI and classifier. So basically, um, this is a very intuitive model, um, which is nice, uh, that also empirically works quite well. Um, so basically, the way this works is we have um, specific representations uh, for the head and for each word as the uh, head and as the dependent. So we have a different MLP that takes in the word representation when it's a head and when it's a dependent. And the reason why this is important is maybe some information is more important when you're ahead, and some information is more important when you're a dependent. So, for example, um, to give an example, like let's say you, the word is a noun. Um, when it is a dependent, it might be more important what types of verbs it associates with, and that might be more, um, more related to its um, what kind of actions it does. So, like dogs can bark. Uh, cats can, uh, well, okay, sorry. Um, dogs, cats, and, uh, and, uh, and humans can all run. So maybe that would be the more important thing when it's uh, dependent. But when it's a head, uh, maybe you need to be more concerned about what adjectives uh, apply to the word. So then you would want to extract features that are more correlated with what sorts of adjectives uh, would apply to it. So basically, the basic idea is that the necessary features differ based on whether it's a uh, uh, head or a dependent. So once you have this, um, there's a by affine function here. So what do we mean by by affine? Basically, what we mean is we have a head. Um, we have a matrix that we multiply um, together here. And then we have the dependent. And the score of the edge between this is this score here, um, added to a score of the head and uh, multiplied by a, a single vector. So basically, this is kind of like our bias. How likely is this to be a head in the first place? Um, so some words, as I said, are very likely to be heads. Um, like verbs are very likely to be heads, uh, whereas determiners are very unlikely to be heads. So the second term uh, corresponds to that. Um, so interestingly, they just optimize the likelihood of picking the correct parent. So each word has a single parent. So they optimize the likelihood of picking the correct parent, no structured training. Um, this is a local model. So they had no like globally normalized training or anything like this. Um, and they just used a minimum spanning tree algorithm at the end. Um, but nonetheless, they got very good results on the universal dependencies parsing task. Um, notably, um, you would kind of think this was magic if you just looked at this result because it's not a super complicated model. Um, however, at their presentation, uh, at, uh, like at the shared task that they were talking about that I was lucky enough to go to, they explained all the hyperparameter tuning that they did to get this result to actually work. And so I think uh, you know, a fair amount of the effectiveness of this model is a result of the you know, extensive hyperparameter tuning they did. 
But you know, that being said, it's great to have a simple model that works well. So, um, so there's that. Um, there's an implementation. I think the original implementation was uh, like in TensorFlow and not super easy to use. Um, uh, Max Ma here at CMU has an implementation of this, a re-implementation of this, uh, where he re-implemented it and beat state of the art by just re-implementing their models. So, um, if you uh, if you want to use implementation, this is also in PyTorch, which I think more people are using. Um, okay, so then global training. Um, we had margin-based global training, local probabilistic training. There's also ways you can create global probabilistic models. Um, so as I mentioned before, a locally normalized model looks a little bit like this. Um, oh, sorry, a globally normalized model looks a little bit like this. So we add up a whole bunch of scores, um, and then we, uh, we add up all of the scores, and we, uh, we normalize. So there are algorithms for calculating partition functions. Um, uh, for projected parsing, uh, there is Eisner's algorithm, which is a bottom-up CKY style algorithm for calculating dependencies. Um, for non-projected -proje parsing, there's something called the matrix tree theorem uh, that can compute uh, marginals over directed graphs. Um, and this, can, this has been applied uh, to neural models also by Mixmod here. So um, if you're interested in this, you can take a look. Okay, um, so I'm almost done. Are there any questions about this uh, so far? No. Okay. Um, I tried to I tried to also give references to toolkits as well in case you want to use them uh, to get parses instead of actually doing parsing yourself. So uh, hopefully that's useful. Um, an alternative. So. Um, I was talking about dynamic programs here. And dynamic programs are nice uh, because they, um, uh, they allow you to you know, optimize other um, you know, otherwise unoptimizable objectives. Um, but another thing you can do is, uh, another, a problem you'll often have is you have a nice model, but it's hard to implement it uh, using a dynamic programming algorithm. So one thing that you can do is try re-ranking. So in other words, you generate with an easy to decode model. So you have some sort of model uh, that is easy to decode, um, and then you rescore it with a proposed model. So you generate a whole bunch of outputs that look pretty reasonable, and then you have a more complicated model, more complicated features that you then use to rescore the outputs. Um, so some examples: uh, very early in the kind of like neural uh, parsing world, there was something called inside-outside recursive neural networks, um, which basically calculate representations um, uh, recursively. Uh, the problem with these is there was no way to do dynamic programming over them, unlike the inside-outside algorithm. So they just generated some outputs and we scored them according to this model and got good results. Um, another example is parsing is language modeling. So they had a, um, uh, basically they trained a language model over lots and lots of parses uh, to try to, um, to try to get good, uh, you know, get a good model. So they used re-ranking for this as well. Um, there's also an, uh, a nice formalism called recurrent neural network grammars, which I talked about a little bit, um, uh, uh, a little bit before. Um, it's like the stack LSTM that I talked about a little bit before. So there's lots of examples of this. Um, so this is definitely something you can do. It's also something that you can do um, for any task, basically. It's not just limited to parsing, so any sort of prediction task. Um, but However, there is one caveat about this. Um, so you have a really nice, you know, theoretically well-founded re-ranking model, um, and it gets uh, state-of-the-art results, which is, which is great. So now you've created a, a wonderful model that looks really good according to re-ranking. So now you want to decode with this model um, and actually generate outputs that maximize the probability according to this model. Um, however, um, this might be an effective model combination. Um, so ensembling or model combination is basically where you take two different models and you combine them together and, uh, and get better results based on this. I talked about it a little bit before. Um, but basically, uh, the model generating the outputs that you end up re-ranking prunes down the, the search space. And then your second re-ranking model chooses only the best, uh, the best parts only in that space. So basically, there's a nice example of this 
where um, in the recurrent neural network grammars paper here, um, they came up with this nice generative model, uh, which is a model that simultaneously generates language and parse trees. And um, it's kind of nice from a, or interesting from a, a linguistics perspective because a lot of linguists say that, you know, um, in our minds we have this generative grammar that allows us to generate uh, language hi hierarchically. Um, so what this paper tried to do is they basically tried to generate uh, models directly from the, um, uh, from the, uh, the generative model. Um, and so the previous results had shown that if you took a discriminative model, which is kind of the more normal um, uh, model that it's easy to decode from, you got 92.2 accuracy. Um, and then if you re-ranked it, re-ranked the hypotheses with the generative model, you got 93.45. However, if they improved the search algorithm and searched basically with the generative model completely, um, they got 90.24. Um, and so then if you generated, uh, or, sorry, if you generated from the generative model and re-ranked with the discriminative model, you got 90.24. If you generated with the generative model and kept the highest scoring one with the generative model, you got 89.55. So suddenly, if you compare these two, you know, the generative model doesn't look quite as nice anymore, and the discriminative model looks better. So um, anytime you're starting to do some sort of re-ranking where you get outputs and you want to re-rank them according to another model, this is just something to be aware of. Um, if all you're aiming for is improvements, then that's great. Uh, but maybe you should also compare it to like an ensemble, where you ensemble uh, two discriminative models together um, and see if the gains are still you know, as impressive after that. So um, yeah, that's something to be aware of. So, OK, I'm a little bit earlier than normal this time, but are there any final questions? OK, if not, we can uh, finish up early. So thanks.